Soy Oscar Umaña, eh, coordinador de Educación Continua para Latinoamérica por WhatsApp. Este, y estamos muy contentos de estar el día de hoy eh, empezando por primera vez nuestro ciclo de Educación Continua para el año 2021. Este, después de un año sumamente complicado que fue el 2020 eh, con, con la pandemia, este, afortunadamente... Este, nuestra profesión no fue de las más afectadas, este, no dudo que hayan colegas que hayan sido afectados en Latinoamérica, este, pero en realidad nos sentimos muy contentos de poder continuar con, con nuestro ciclo de educación continua eh, correspondiente al 2020 por esta forma virtual, en este primer congreso eh, virtual eh, de Latinoamérica eh, auspiciado por WhatsApp, exclusivo para asociados de, de nuestras diferentes asociaciones en Latinoamérica, valga la redundancia, y que por ser afiliados nosotros como asociaciones a WhatsApp, este, recibimos este beneficio. Eh, indudablemente es algo que ha tomado cierto esfuerzo para todos este, eh, adaptarnos a esta, a esta nueva situación, pero el objetivo fundamental de seguir brindando educación continua de parte de WhatsApp la mayoría de veterinarios y colegas, eh, eh, en realidad que es muy, eh, es muy gratificante. Y este, pues eh, explicando un poco lo que, es, lo que hemos querido hacer este, y somos pioneros en, la, en todo la WhatsApp en este congreso, es un ciclo de charlas semanales por, por tres semanas este, a partir del día de hoy, eh, en la cual hemos... Eh, consensuado un grupo, un, un grupo de, de temas de interés eh, en las diferentes asociaciones en beneficio de nuestros asociados. Entonces iniciamos esta semana con el tema de, de, de redes sociales con Eric García de Estados Unidos, este, eh, donde nos brindará eh, un par de charlas acerca del, eh, de los eh, odiadores en línea o ciberbullying que se da en línea el día de hoy y el jueves el manejo en general de, de redes sociales como herramienta de mercadeo. Eh, pasamos a la segunda semana con, con temas de oncología, este, el diagnóstico clínico de, de oncología y este, el manejo nutricional del paciente oncológico. Y cerramos la tercera semana, la última semana de enero, con el, eh, el tema de abordaje quirúrgico de pacientes oncológicos, este, a donde tendremos... Este, en las intervenciones de colegas de México y de, y de Argentina. Entonces, eh, nos sentimos muy, de nuevo, muy, muy gratificados, muy contentos por esta eh, nueva jornada de eventos de educación continua, donde queremos este, eh, tener por lo menos esa, esa presencia. Idealmente queremos seguir nuestra, nuestra educación continua eh, en vivo, este, pero con tanta incertidumbre será difícil. Sin embargo, estoy seguro que pronto estaremos juntos, podremos celebrar este, congresos eh, juntos. Y en realidad, por el momento, solo quería presentarme. Yo estaré, seré moderador en todos los eventos, estaré aquí para apoyarlos, este, para eh, el día de hoy ayudar en, en preguntas y respuestas, eh, en, en la traducción con Eric. Entonces, este, pues no quiero quitar más tiempo del día de hoy. Eh, Quiero dejarles el video, este, este ciclo es pregrabado todo, sin embargo, Eric nos estará acompañando al final para preguntas y respuestas. Este, no duden en dejar su, sus preguntas en el chat este, y de ahí iremos seleccionando y tendremos unos 15, 20 minutos para poder eva, em, em, evacuar esas dudas o preguntas que tengan. Esperamos la colaboración de todos y pues... Bienvenidos a este primer congreso latinoamericano virtual este, auspiciado por WhatsApp. Muchas gracias. Hello everyone, it is Eric Garcia here with Simply Done Social to talk about something that is all too important. And that is how do we handle online haters? When pet owners go online, things go awry, they become upset, they start venting. 
but they don't vent just to one person. They vent to multiple and the whole universe that Google's veterinary practices in your area can now see this. So it becomes a huge concern for a lot of practices. And I want to make sure that in this simply done social training module that we answer the almighty question, what do we do when? So handling online haters is a little bit more than just making sure that we tell our side of the story. It's also a very important marketing tactic. And the reason for that is, is because if we can't get control of our reputation online, if we don't have a handle of what people are saying about us, then our marketing efforts are not going to be nearly as successful. Here's what I mean by that. Say, for example, you have a Google advertising campaign or you just invested in a beautiful new website and you spend all this time and energy creating something that you're proud of, something that you feel truly represents who you are. But before people even get to that website, they have to first start by finding you. Pet owners will often go to google.com. They'll type in, type in a veterinarian in and then hopefully your practice will show up. If your practice shows up and you have an overwhelming amount of negative reviews, we know that pet owners are not going to choose your practice. But we put an emphasis on the word if. And the reason we put an emphasis on the word if is because Google's algorithm is set as such. When Google is determining how to rank websites online, they look at reviews. Up to 80% of what goes into how you rank online making sure that you rank highly in search is all consistent upon your ability to obtain fresh, new, positive Google reviews. That's something that we'll talk about in a future training module, how we ask our pet owners to get those reviews to us, and more importantly, how we take control of those listings. But for now, we're gonna keep the conversation focused on how to handle the online haters. So if your practice has an overwhelming amount of negative reviews online, then what ends up happening is Google suppresses your listing. And the reason for that is it's a key ranking factor. It's a core part of their algorithm. And the reason they do it is because they're trying to enhance the user search experience. What I mean by that is if I'm searching for a veterinarian or a steak restaurant or a vegan restaurant, two completely opposite things, if I'm searching for them online, Google will only show me the businesses that have great reviews online first. And the reason for that is, is because me as a Google user, I don't want to have to work too hard to find the business that I want to go to. I don't want to find businesses that have negative reputations in the community because that's all that's going to do for me as a Google user is make me work harder and take more time to search deeper into a Google search to determine ultimately where I want to go. So what Google does to streamline this process for us is they try to take the guesswork out of us. They push us listings that have great feedback because Google knows that we're more likely to go to one of those listings. And at the end of the day, it provides a better search experience for us. So it's important not only that we get a hold of our reputation because of the fact that it's a Google uh, uh, ranking uh, system uh, and it's important for that, but we also wanna do it because we don't want a poor reputation. Chances are that word of mouth are one of your top three referral sources in your practice. It is for most veterinary practices. We know where those people are coming from is changing, right? I might have great experience and tell a friend or a family member in person, but if I have a horrible experience or a great experience, I'm more likely to go online and share my feedback with the entire world for everyone to be able to see it for better or worse. So what do we do? What happened about us online that we don't particularly enjoy that is gonna take away from our reputation? So first and foremost, if someone says something about you in a closed community or a public forum, for example, a Facebook group, it is absolutely important and critical that you don't engage with that posting. And here's why. We don't wanna engage with that posting because we know that a majority of people in groups according to studies, feel entitled to say what they want to say. And so they become more aggressive as a result of that. Minds are often not changed. That is the nature of how these groups work. I want to share two examples with you of real veterinary practices 
who didn't take that advice had a practice one to reach out to me out of uh, Fort Worth, Texas. And a practice manager sent me an email. And there is a local community Facebook group. And what I mean by that is there's a, a group on Facebook that is for, uh, makes up a few neighborhoods in the community. Neighborhoods that this veterinary practice very well attracts clients from. And there were a large number of people a part of this group. Well, a pet owner one day decided that they didn't have a great experience. So they went into the group and they trash talked the veterinary practice. They said some not so nice things. When the manager reached out to me, she was asking for my advice. My advice was just what I'd mentioned to you. Let's leave it alone. Let's not engage with it. And I hear back from her about a week later, or, or not even a week later. And she says, I wish I'd taken your advice, but I responded. And the reason I responded, Eric, is because that was our practice. That is a community we service. This is going to hurt our practice. We're not going to be able to grow. So it was important that we responded and we thought that was the best thing to do against your advice, which I respect. But what ended up happening was what I see happen often. When the practice manager responded and all she said, by the way, was we're sorry about your experience. We would love to talk to you about this. Please call us, something very basic. But when you say that in an uncontrolled environment, in an environment where people can say as much as they want after you say what you want, it often attracts more negativity. In this instance, it did. The, vet, the uh, uh, pet owner responded back and was even more aggressive. She accused the practice manager of infiltrating the Facebook group, of trying to silence, these are actual words that this pet owner used, that we're trying to silence this pet owner. And unfortunately, became more aggressive, went on live, on other websites and started saying more things because now this person knew that this individual, that this veterinary practice was affected and that it bothered them. And so now they really wanted to hurt this practice. We know that this has happened on numerous occasions and unfortunately it's getting worse. So when a pet owner responds to you by leaving you a negative review or a negative sentiment of some sort in a closed group, we wanna leave it alone. Here's an example of another practice where things kind of took a different turn and in some sense for the better, but wasn't really an ideal situation to begin with. Same instance, veterinarian reached out to me. Someone said something about them in a closed group that they didn't particularly like. I advise that they don't touch it. They responded anyway, and I heard back from them a few days later, and the client became more aggressive. Again, also left more reviews on other places online. But what ended up happening in this instance, and happens in many cases, but certainly not all, is that other pet owners jumped in. But this time, pet owners were jumping in to defend the veterinarian who was being attacked. They were saying that it wasn't fair for the pet owner to be saying what they want. And when that happens, I want you to leave it alone yet again. This veterinarian did reach out to me again and say, Eric, I didn't take your advice. The owner is now more aggressive. We have more negative reviews from this owner and other places online, but we noticed a lot of our existing clients are defending us. What should we do? And I let them know to leave it alone. We don't want to engage with our existing pet owners to say, thank you so much for saying this. This person is insane. We don't want to participate in that conversation. The issue is, is that you and the longer you participate, the longer that you're going to add fuel to the fire, the longer that this negative information will continue to be spread about your practice. So we want the conversation to die out and it's best that we leave it alone in, in that instance. But what happens when someone else goes online and decides to attack your practice? What can we do to protect ourselves? Well, a few things that you should consider doing is that if you offer any type of controversial service where pet owner, where you might offer declawing, tail docking, ear cropping, or any service that again is deemed controversial, I recommend that you remove it from your website and that you handle that conversation in the exam room with that pet owner. And the reason for that is, is because there are very aggressive advocacy groups that are attacking veterinarians who list these services on their website. 
literally sit behind their computer, type in declawing, tail dog cropping, and any veterinarian that comes up, any of those services on their website, they attack in the masses and they leave a large number of negative reviews online through Google, be it Yelp, Facebook, and, and other places. And so it's important that to protect ourselves, we don't list those services on our website if we even offer those services to lessen the impact of an extreme aggressive cyberbullying instance. But what else could we do to protect ourselves? What happens when someone says something that we don't particularly like, whether it's true or not? It is hard to determine a silver bullet for every single instance in terms of how we can respond. But I will tell you that this advice here works in a majority of cases. And I recommend that you consider taking advice if this advice, if you receive a negative review online. So first and foremost, if someone says something about you online that we don't particularly like, again, whether it's true or not, I don't want you to respond right away. In fact, I want you to wait anywhere from 24 to 72 hours before you respond to that review. Now, why do I recommend that? Because a lot of people will assume that if someone says something negative, we should jump in and, and respond back right away. And if we don't, that it's going to hurt our practice even more by waiting longer. My friends, that's simply not true. The reason that I want you to wait 24 to 72 hours is rather simple. According to lead psychologists, we know that people oftentimes need time to be able to cope with their feelings and their emotions. Here's an example. Have you ever gotten in a fight with a friend, a family member, or maybe your significant other? Have you ever said something you don't particularly mean? And if you meant it, you probably shouldn't have said it? Yeah, we, we're, we're human, we, we've all done that. I know certainly I've done that. The reason we react is because we haven't had time to cope with that emotion, to cope with those feelings. And oftentimes, the longer that we wait on it, the more that we sleep on it, the less aggressive we become about our feelings. The more rational we become, the more time goes on. So when there's a client who feels negatively about your practice, we want to let them sit on it for 24 to 72 hours because we want that client to come to a realization about the reality of the experience. Maybe they had a bad experience, but maybe it wasn't as bad as they said, or maybe they shouldn't have been as aggressive as they were. Oftentimes when people sleep on things just for a day, we feel differently. And here's the thing, if we're not doing it for the client, we're doing it for yourself. I've seen countless veterinary professionals that have embarrassed themselves in responding to negative reviews because they've responded with emotions because they were so upset about that situation that they decided that responding now was what they needed to do. And in many cases, they've responded in a way that doesn't reflect the practice in a positive way. They said things they don't mean. And if they meant it, they shouldn't have said it. So it's important that we let tensions cool down. But it is true that eventually we're going to have to get back to that review at some point, whether it's a day later or three days later. If the review's about you, maybe you're the technician who trimmed those pugs' nails too short. Maybe you're the veterinarian who failed to provide value. Maybe you're the customer service representative that was being sassy with the pet owner. If the negative review is about you, you want to leave it alone for, again, up to 72 hours. Now, if the review really affects you, then it's okay to sit on it for longer than that. I can tell you I've had my own instance before and I needed to sit on it for a little while. And I urge you to do the same. But eventually we're gonna have to get back to that and we're gonna have to react in some way. So first and foremost, it is important that you pull the client's medical record and you pick up the phone and you call that client and you discuss the situation. I always encourage you to think about this. When was the last time that you had a pet owner who didn't have a great experience, who vocalized it in the practice, or who maybe told the receptionist in a subsequent follow-up visit, and then you contacted them and you were able to resolve the misunderstanding. You were able to apologize if you indeed did mess up. 
And as a result of that, you are able to save the pet owner from going somewhere else and leaving your practice indefinitely. How many times has that, has that happened to you? It's probably happened quite often. And so it's important that we make sure that we try to resolve those situations, but we do so by talking to the client over the phone. Oftentimes things can be misinterpreted online and we don't wanna leave room for imagination. But the other thing that we wanna make sure we do is that we take an opportunity to respond to the review if the pet owner doesn't pick up the phone. So what you wanna say, for example, is we apologize about your experience. We have not been able to reach you by telephone. We would like to make this situation right with you. Please call our practice or our medical director or our practice manager at, and then list the practice phone number. Now, there are a few reasons as to why we want to respond if we called the client and we weren't able to get a hold of them. One of the reasons is we do want something there when we get a negative review, certainly not in every instance, and we'll talk about that in a moment, but we want some responses to some of our negative reviews and we want something there. Even if the pet owner doesn't call you, what people will see is that you recognize that something went wrong and you tried to fix it. Because at the end of the day, when people express negative sentiments online, your response is an extension of your customer service efforts. And we should also never assume that because someone leaves you a negative review online that they never wanna come back to your practice. Sometimes this is a way that people are more comfortable in sharing negative sentiments about your practice. If the client calls you, then great. Hopefully you're able to resolve this situation. But if you're not able to resolve this situation, again, people are able to see that you reached out that you didn't become aggressive and you tried to right that situation, but you also didn't admit to your fault or it being your fault. And you were empathetic by apologizing for how they feel. If someone goes online and they leave you a negative review and they start saying something about the care that you provided their pet, maybe they start making accusations like you overdosed my pet on this medication or you gave my pet this medication that shouldn't have received this medication. Or maybe they say something like, you didn't hospitalize my pet long enough and my pet is more sick because of you. And they start addressing the specific information that you provided them, whether it's reality or not. We don't wanna respond back by defending our medicine. If we do that, we can actually be reported to our state boards. And the reason for that is, is if you respond back by saying, actually, Mr. Garcia, we gave your pet this dose of medication and we hospitalized your pet for five days instead of 24 hours like you said. Oh, and by the way, you didn't pay your bill. If we respond back in that manner, we're now divulging information about the care of that pet, things that should have been kept confidential in that pet's medical record. Every veterinary state board and governing body across the world has a confidentiality clause. And it is important that we make sure that we abide by that confidentiality clause to make sure that we protect our pet owners, even though it is indeed true that they are the ones who started sharing that information. But they have the right to choose what they want to share. That's not your determination to make, unfortunately. So even though we're not held to HIPAA standards, again, we are held to those standards in the Veterinary uh, Practice uh, Act in every state, province, and country. So instead, I want you to respond back by saying something like, we apologize for your experience. Due to client-patient confidentiality laws, we are unable to discuss this medical case in a public forum. We highly encourage you to contact us to discuss this case on a one-on-one -on -one basis with our medical director. We want to review your pet's medical record and review this case in further detail. Our medical director can be reached at, and then again, provide the practice phone number. In both of these responses, we provided the practice phone number, but we also provided who in the practice it is that should handle these cases here, these clients who feel the way they do. Now, the reason that this is important to note is because it shows that we truly care. If we said, oh, we're sorry about your experience, call us if you wanna talk, well, that doesn't show that you actually care. But if you actually say, my name is so-and-so, I am such and such, and I can be reached at this number. Well, now we're showing people that we truly care. There is one type of review I don't want you to touch. 
don't engage with crazy, right? You know who crazy is. Crazy is the person who left you a review in all capital letters. They don't really know anything about periods. They only know things about exclamation points. And so it is important that when we see crazy, and crazy, by the way, of course, in her review or his review, has riddled facts, uh, is riddled with uh, non-factual information in most cases. We want to make sure that we don't engage with crazy. When we engage with crazy, we know that crazy becomes more aggressive. I have seen crazy where a veterinary practice has responded. Crazy has removed the review, which means that your response gets removed. And then they wrote a new review, but this time the review is longer, more scathing, and there are tons more explanation points. And so we want to make sure that we don't engage with crazy. But it is important to recognize that not everyone who leaves a negative review is crazy. A lot of times practices will tell me, Eric, it is true that only people who have negative sentiments will go online and say things, but rarely will people who have a positive experience proactively go out online and say something good about us. I can tell you 100% that is not a true statement. I've been working with veterinary practices for well over a decade. I see far more positivity, and not by a small margin, but by a large margin than I ever actually see negativity. So when we do see negativity, it's important to find out what went wrong, to own up when we messed up. And when it's not true that we respond back, try to, to engage that pet owner. I recommend that you communicate with your team when you get a negative review and use it as a learning experience if you did indeed mess up. Bring it to your team, let them know that we messed up in this situation. What can we do to make sure that this doesn't happen again? But just like we wanna make sure that we bring the negative reviews to our team members so we can learn from those, it is important that we also share the positive reviews with our team members. We don't only wanna bring news to our team when it's negative. We wanna show our, our employees and our team members that if someone says something positive about us online, like they do an overwhelming amount, that they recognize that. So they know that the blood, sweat, and tears that they put into the client experience actually does get noticed. So it's important that we take an opportunity to share positive reviews with our team members so this way, when we get negative reviews, we can all learn from it together. Responding to a client who felt negatively about you goes a long way. This is an example of a review that came in from a revised review that came in from a pet owner. The original review was a one star scathing review of this veterinary practice. The practice administrator pulled the medical record, called the client over the phone. Certainly, she didn't do this day one. She let a few days go by because as we talked about, it is important to let everyone cool down. The veterinarian that was involved, the practice manager who was defending the veterinarian, and certainly the client who felt they were wrong. So once everyone was cooled down, she called the, pre the, the pet owner that they were able to resolve a simple misunderstanding. And now you can see the pet owner went back revised the review three days later, and started sharing her positive experience with the practice. This is something that we see happen all the time. Not always does someone go online and update their review, sometimes they just remove it, and sometimes they forget it's there. If there's a review that's left from you, for you, and it's not actually meant for you, maybe it's a practice with a similar name in a different country, state, or province, Maybe someone left a review and it violated policy. An example of a review that violates policy is that if I were to leave a review, but I actually weren't, I, I'm actually not your patient or your client. Here's an example of what that looks like. If I came into my, your veterinary practice with my mother and I didn't like how you treated my mother, and I went on Google and I left a review and I said, I came into this veterinary practice and my mom is the client and they treated her like crap. I don't like them. That violates policy because it's not my, actually, my actual mother who left that review. 
I myself am not the client. So you can report that review. How you report a review on Google is rather simple. When you see the review, there are three little dots on the right hand side of your screen. What you want to go ahead and do is report that review. Then after you report that review, you want to go ahead and log into your Google account. When you log into your Google account at the very bottom, you will see an icon that says support. And then you'll see something that says need more help. Go ahead and click on those two options there. Select the category for customer reviews and photos. And then you have three options to contact Google. You can request a callback, request a chat, or request email support. I don't actually recommend dealing with Google over the phone. I recommend that you deal with Google via chat or email support. The reason for this is Google support is outsourced. The folks who are handling the Google support requests, English is often not their native language. And there can be language barrier problems that occur over the telephone that become harder to communicate your point. We want to encourage you to leave a ch or, uh, to actively chat or to utilize email support where it becomes easier and less pressure put on the customer support representative who's handling that request. Share your feedback in terms of what happened and request that Google remove the review. In many instances, Google will remove the review, but not in 100% of cases. So if Google doesn't remove the review, then that's okay, we've tried to do our best. If Google does remove the review, it is important to recognize this. We don't want to abuse this privilege of reporting reviews. If you report every single negative review that you get to Google support, they will know that, and they will be less likely to hear out your concerns. So I only recommend that you use this when you absolutely need it. So this way, they can come to our support. You can also do the same thing on Yelp. This is a real example of a veterinary practice where someone who said they were a client of this uh, cat practice, uh, the veterinarian in that practice killed their cat. Very aggressive review. The practice reached out to me. They said the, the person who was claiming to be a client isn't really a client. And so we reported that review to Yelp. You can contact Yelp's toll-free number on their yelp.com forward slash business support link. We also reported it online. Yelp sent us an email saying that they've received the report and they will look into it. And just a few days later, we received a response from Yelp that acknowledges our request and they have removed the review from the pet owner. So again, we see this happen all the time. This is a colleague of mine who followed those same steps when it came to a Yelp review. They reported the review online and Yelp removed the review. So please only reserve this right for those instances where it is completely unfactual or it violates Yelp policy or Google policy in the way that we discussed. If you're cyber bullied online, it is important that you seek the assistance of the AVMA cyberbullying hotline or that you reach out to a practice management consultant who specializes in handling extreme forms of cyberbullying. The reason that we want to do this is so we can make sure that we respond to extreme cyberbullying cases in a way that's actually going to reflect our practice in a positive light. I want to share a quick example of a very extreme cyberbullying case. I want to share the example for a few reasons because there are some things that we can learn from this. But the first thing that we can learn from this is that no matter how aggressive the negative review seems, no matter how aggressive the cyberbullying instance becomes on social media, no matter how many people see it, no matter how bad you feel about it, I can guarantee you that you can get past it and that your practice will thrive and that it will not bring down your practice and you will not close your doors as a result of that. That I can guarantee you. This was a very extreme form of cyberbullying. It was a practice we just started working with. A pet owner went online to share an experience about 
the treatment that her goats received in this veterinary practice. When she shared this, there were over 500 people who liked the post, 177 comments, and 670 shares. Now, what I can guarantee you is that easily over 20 to 30 to 40, possibly over 100,000 people were able to see this post. And we know that based off of the number of shares and the number of people who have liked that post. Now, here's the worst thing, is that this is a veterinarian in a very rural community. The nearest veterinarian is only another 20 to 30 miles away. This was a town of only a few thousand people. This posting reached more than the number of people who lived in their town altogether. Now, when this practice reached out to us, they reached out to us because their new client numbers weren't growing before this instance. Then this happened, and they just knew that they'd sealed their fate, that there's never going to be anything that they can do to grow, that marketing wouldn't be able to fix this terrible mistake. The reason they felt that way is because when this client left this review on Facebook, people that saw this review, pet owners that went to this veterinarian were calling and canceling their appointments. They didn't want this veterinarian to treat their pets. There were people who were calling to tell the veterinarian they were disappointed in them. There were people talking in the town, employees that went to the grocery stores were being asked by pet owners about what happened. It became a very extreme form of cyberbullying in a very small community, something that no one ever wants to need to prepare for. But the reason I share this is that in these cases, this is beyond crazy. And what I mean by beyond crazy is that I mentioned that we shouldn't respond to crazy, but when someone goes online and it becomes viral and hundreds and hundreds of people begin to engage with it, then no matter what it is, in a majority of cases, we're going to need to re respond. We're going to need to defend ourselves. And that's exactly what the practice did. They went to Facebook and they shared with their community what had transpired. Naturally, when you do that and you become honest and forward about the situation, those people who attacked you are going to continue to attack you. And if that happens, I recommend that you click on that comment, you hide it, and after you hide the comment, Facebook will ask you if you want to ban the user from your page, in which I recommend you do. When you ban someone from your Facebook page, they don't get an email or a notification that says they have been banned. They don't know they've been banned. All that happens is that they'll never be able to find your Facebook page and that they'll never be able to comment on anything that you ever post again from that profile. And the reason that I recommend you ban them is because that's someone who's never going to use your page in a positive way. That is someone who's never going to contribute to what you're saying in a productive manner. So it's important that we ban that person. What happened in this instance, of course, was that people were banned, but there was this large community that came together to support this veterinarian. Remember how we talked about in the Facebook groups in the second story, how the veterinarian reported back that her pet owners were defending her and that she wanted to jump in and appreciate those pet owners? Well, same thing happened here, except this happened publicly. Pet owners were saying, I don't know what happened in this situation, but I can tell you I trust this veterinarian. Since the original negative cyberbullying instance was about goats, a pet owner responded and said that they had over 80 sheep and 70 goats seen by this veterinarian for over 10 years and that they trust no one other than him. There was this large outpouring of love. And today, the veterinary practice is thriving. The veterinary practice is doing well. They are seeing record numbers that they've never seen in new clients. And I shared this story with you to, 
to give you confidence that if you are ever attacked in the most extress- excessive manner, that at the end of the day, it will be okay. And there is hope and you will thrive. But we just have to get over the bump in the road. You want to have a team meeting. We want to let our team members know about the importance of reviews online. So this way that they too can recognize the importance of our reputation in the community and the importance of our reputation on Google, Facebook, and other review places online. One of the last things that I'll leave you with is that if you're a practice and you have a one-star review, but you have over 200 one-star reviews, it is time that we reflect inward and that we recognize that there's something going on with the way that we're running our practice, the way that we provide care. I certainly don't see this often. It is an extreme rarity for me to ever come across a practice with this negative of reputation online. But if you have a reputation like this online, this is beyond cyberbullying. This is beyond an upset pet owner. This is a cry for help, a cry to let you know that there are things that you need to work on within your client experience to turn, turn things around. I've counseled so many veterinarians that have had poor reputations. They got their brand advocates to sing their praises online to turn around their reputation, to grow their practice because they reflected on the issues that were occurring in the practice. They made a commitment to resolve them and provide a better experience and that they did. And now they too are thriving. So it is important that if you are this practice that you focus on your client experience, that you find out why people feel this way, you see if there's any type of commonality and you work toward fixing that. I wanna thank you so much for watching this training module about how to handle online haters. Now, in this training module, there is a feature down below that you can utilize to ask questions, to share feedback. I encourage that you do that. If you have a negative review and you don't know what to do, if you have an experience of cyberbullying, we would love to hear from you. That is what this community is about, and I encourage you to engage with us. Thank you so much. Bueno, vamos a, a esta vez vamos a posponer eh, las preguntas este, para el evento del jueves debido a que en realidad no teníamos muchas preguntas y, y Eric está solo disponible para ese momento de, de preguntas y respuestas. Este, entonces no duden en, en hacer su, hacernos llegar sus preguntas, ya sea el jueves, posteando en, 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 el, en el chat, eh, pueden poner sus preguntas ahí. Y el jueves dedicaremos un poco más de tiempo para responder, eh, responder las preguntas las, o las dudas que tengan. Este, creo que sin duda el tema de hoy es bastante interesante e importante para nosotros porque cada día más nos exponemos a, a críticas negativas, críticas positivas en algunos casos. Este, pero en realidad la importancia de las críticas negativas es... Este, eh, nos afectan mucho y, y eventualmente con tanta competencia eh, es importante saber lidiar con esto. El, el jueves el tema va a ser no tan negativo, sino cómo aprovechar estas herramientas de redes sociales para nuestro beneficio. Eh, entonces, eh, posponemos un poco lo de las preguntas y respuestas para la semana entrante, eh, perdón, para el jueves próximo. Ahí nos van a poder eh, a, eh, postear en, en las... En, en el chat sus preguntas y Eric en vivo las podrá responder en ese momento. Entonces, por el momento damos por concluida la, la sesión de hoy. Espero que haya sido de su interés y espero que les haya gustado el, el formato que estamos teniendo. Eh, igual estamos abiertos a nuevos procedimientos, a nuevos procesos, este, pero agradecemos su, su atención eh, y nos estamos viendo el, el jueves. Eh, con, con Eric García nuevamente. Eh, muchas gracias y estamos en, en contacto en las próximas sesiones. Hasta luego.